with the with your microphone. Hello? Hello? Oh. Can you turn them on? On? Hello? 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 Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, all right. So, yes, we're going to talk about um, narrative and a budget. Uh, and um, we're going to introduce ourselves really quick. Uh, I'm Clara fernandez Vara. I'm a faculty member at the NYU Game Center. Thank you. <laughs> um, and before that, I worked at MIT, uh, making games with students for a long time. So did Matt. Uh, yes, I'm Matthew Weiss. I also worked at MIT doing the same kind of uh, short projects, which is one of the uh, uh, key things about, <coughs> about us, which is why we're going to talk about narrative on a budget. Uh, I also worked at uh, Harmonix last year on the uh, Fantasia game uh, that is uh, going to come out this year. Uh, and because of our experience, we are, have got to be very good at making games that are about narrative. Narrative is our focus, is what we care the most about when we make games. Um, but, um, you know, as we're going to see, it can be kind of complicated when you don't have a lot of resources. So we're very good at making the best out of our resources. Uh, and we're going to explain to you what our bag of tricks is. Um, so basically, um, a narrative, having a narrative premise, a narrative framework to present your, your game creates an identity for your game. It helps identify it. It also helps get across what the game is about. We have a story. It's much easier to story size it and say, well, this game is about um, picking up flowers in a beautiful garden uh, rather than we are going to uh, optimize you know, picking up uh, all the best power-ups for a while. You know, the flowers are a bit more memorable, even if it's a bit lame. Uh, but th the idea is to help explain the mechanics in a very concise, memorable way. We remember stories better than a set of rules. Uh, but narrative can also be very tricky to include, especially when you're an indie developer, developer uh, because it can be expensive. It does uh, require a lot of um, uh, resources. So we're going to show you a little video of a game that was released uh, a few months, months ago uh, and what happened to it, uh, what happens uh, at the end of the game. So uh, let's uh, walk through here and see what we got to do. Sorry. Rather not be. M what the hell? You have reached the end of the game, but there may be more left to explore. What? What the fuck? Okay, now we're on the screen to return to the main menu. What the fuck is that? <laughs> So it's, this is very sad. I mean, it's funny, but just imagine. I mean, the, the player was really frustrated. Like, what's the end of my game? Is this the end? What happened? Uh, and the developer said, why um, we had to um, start a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter didn't pan out. We didn't have the budget, so we cut there. And we put a card with the story, so there. Um, so basically, what we're going to talk about today is ways to avoid that. Uh, because even if you don't have the budget, there are other ways in which you can create an narrative for your game where you don't need to, you know, spend a lot of money on a cutscene. Uh, yeah, and this is also something that uh, in recent years has become more popular for indies. There's <coughs> it's actually not unusual for indie games now to be very narrative focused. Uh, obviously, stuff like Dear Esther and Gone Home and many others have put a lot of this stuff on the map. And also, uh, they use a lot of the tactics that we're going to talk about. And um, one of the things they do is uh, not focusing so much in cutscenes, but uh, choosing the right verbs, the right elements, uh, the right world to get the player to imagine a story. So we're going to go into that a bit here. Let's see. And this is also me. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, so one of the things that people always talk about when they talk about narrative is they use the word plot a lot, and we really feel like it's important to say that narrative is not plot. Uh, narrative is character and setting coming together to create drama, and that can happen in a variety, of, a variety of ways. It can happen through gameplay, and it can happen any way you choose to express character and drama in your game, uh, and we're going to talk about our core strategies for doing that in a cost-effective way. 
Yes, because what we care about is really, you know, these little tricks to create a world that is interesting to interact with. So these are our narrative mantras. We try to have something that is memorable and, and, and you know, easy and catchy. Um, so first of all, your title is your story. Verbs are a story. Your story is your tutorial. Reuse assets. Sounds or animations is my favorite. And text is your friend. <laughs> so your title is your story. Uh, finding the right title for your game is not only a good strategy to be the first hit in Google, uh, it's also a way to transmit what your game is about. Uh, space Invaders is kind of obvious, like, well, there's people from space invading. There you go, mechanics. Uh, Zombies Ate My Neighbors is a personal favorite of mine because it's evoking a kind of suburban uh, space run over by zombies, and you're probably going to have to fight the zombies. Uh, Thomas Was Alone is a good example of how to tell you first who you are in the game, and then what's alone. It's already kind of uh, implying that there's something lurking there. So it's alone. Is, is he really alone? Um, so he's already getting across the theme of the game. And then we have uh, Life Flashes By, which is an adventure game where you are literally seeing the, the flashes through the life of the character who you are, and you're evaluating what she's gone through her life and, and kind of having this, this um, you know, the, the flashes that you have before something, you know, traumatic happens to you. Uh, and that's what the game is about. Um, you know, very few words, you know, we have uh, the, the topmost is four words, and we're already getting across what the mechanics, what the game is about. Uh, and so this is one thing that we like to uh, talk about a lot, which is that verbs are story. Uh, the core actions you do in the game are what the game is about, uh, pretty much regardless of what you say. So how many people have played uh, Red Dead Redemption? So remember all those, you know, redemption-oriented mechanics in that game? Uh, there's a lot of shooting in that game, right? So uh, one, of the, uh, the, one of the ideas here is that games that really embody their stories in their mechanics uh, uh, are going to express story through them, right? And so when the player plays the game, they're going to experience the story that way. So uh, here we have Dysphoria and Mainichi. Dysphoria is about a trans woman who's going through hormone replacement therapy and how that makes her feel and the daily experience of that. So this is just one screenshot, which is, uh, so one of the opera op operative ver verbs here is fitting in, uh, what it feels like to feel out of place. And um, I know that some of the other stuff in the game was we have uh, things like you know taking your pills, you know, yes. uh, defending oneself from um, insults from other people, defending and being insulted. You know, is another uh, verb that we have that is not your usual jump, run, shoot. Yeah, so it's not like you're jumping on platforms and then there's a cutscene where you're talking about this. This is the game, uh, and it's the story. So, uh, and Mainichi is a game that's really about how people treat you in public. It's about the choices you make when you get dressed in the morning and how you present yourself. And it's, uh, uh, to an extent, it's a game about cat calls. It's about what happens when people uh, point at you on the street and say things to you based on choices you make. And those, those are choices that you make in the game every moment, like what to wear, how to behave, what to say, et cetera. And um, we can go. Um, and another uh, good way to think about this is uh, your story is your tutorial. I think that if you have your story set up uh, correctly, uh, you won't be able to describe the story uh, without also describing the gameplay. And uh, this game on the left is uh, Alitza Dimitrova, which is about uh, a, a homeless kid in uh, St. Petersburg and what he has to do to survive and how he has to take what's around him in order to try to give his mother money uh, in order to survive on the street. And that's basically, I've just described exactly what you do in the game, uh, in the core gameplay. Uh, and this game on the right is a game that uh, I worked on with a group of students at uh, MIT uh, called Gumbeat, where you live in an oppressive society that hates gum, and uh, you blow bubbles at police to try to start a gum-based revolution. Uh, and that really is exactly what the core gameplay is. So I just described exactly what you do with the buttons, uh, et cetera. Then there are some of the tricks that are kind of more, um, you know, might, they might be familiar to you, the idea of reusing assets. Of course you would reuse assets rather than create specific assets. And this is at times very difficult when you're working on a narrative game um, because you basically um, find out that 
uh, when you want to tell a story, you have to create, you know, the characters, the dialogue, you know, like all the little steps, and that is very, very uh, resource intensive. And by resource intensive, it means you need a writer. You need writers to write, by the way, you know, everybody thinks that they can write, and a lot of people can, but a lot of others cannot. So get a writer, um, <laughs> artist, sound design, you know, and, and game design too. I mean, we both work on what we call narrative design. Um, so reusing assets is not always easy, but it can be used in very expressive ways. So for example, um, I chose Gone Home um, because I realized that a lot of the um, when you go around and go home, we have all these cardboard boxes, which is probably the most, the, the easiest asset to make when you are uh, working in 3D. You make a box. It's probably like the default. You put a nice skin on it, and here are all these cardboard boxes. Well, um, this is used in a very clever way because what it's telling us is that in this house, people just moved in, and they haven't had quite the time to uh, unpack. They also have tons and tons of, car uh, of, of boxes, and the, the house is big. So of course it makes sense that there is um, so, much, um, uh, so much to still unpack, and you don't have, uh, like you see some of the boxes that are open, uh, but the idea of using a very simple asset that is being reused uh, to tell something, is telling us a story, is telling us like who these people are, uh, and it's like the cheapest asset um, that, that you can make, and it's also all over the place. And also, th the fact that it's reused is, mm -hmm. narr is narratively significant, yep. the fact that there's a lot of them. Um, so <coughs> one, of the other th one of the other examples we have here is uh, Analog A Hate Story, which is a visual novel. And <coughs> uh, this is a famous uh, indie example of uh, this genre, which is uh, very asset light in a lot of ways. You see a lot of the same assets over and over, because it's about talking to a core set of people. And it's typically not that animated, which is one of the reasons why it's called a visual novel. And uh, but they use the same characters over and over and over again. Like you see the same five people, the same uh, you know five or six expressions, or sometimes even le even less than that in a whole game. Um, and these games are famous for narrative. They're games that are about you know complex worlds of social mechanics and uh, getting to know people, betrayal, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and these games are famous for it, and they use uh, like a tenth of the asset. Uh, asset footprint of uh, many other kinds of games. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you are actually combining them, that you're using the same ones, but you're actually combining them. Kind of like a grammar of your game. You find your vocabulary of your game and how you combine those elements in order to construct the narrative. Um, so this is, this is probably my, my favorite trick uh, because I use it a lot. Uh, I work in adventure games and I usually, when I get my team together, I usually tell my um, sound designer, you are the animator. And this is basically taking advantage of how our brain works. Let me show you Mist. By the way, Mist is, I guess that back in the day, we could have considered it an indie game. It was made by two people, right? Um, you know, they, they were kind of like finding their way. Now it's 20 years old and we have this as a kind of milestone. But you know, back in the day, the, the kind of resources that they had uh, was, you know, um, closer to what we would call indie now. So let me show you this bit of mist, if the video works. There you go. So we're in this island. We're going around. It's outside. It's windy. It's water. Exploring. And if you know mist, you know that all these are still photos. They use water sounds to make the water feel like it's moving. And it doesn't move, but you, we feel that it is. It's part of the, not only the ambience, uh, but it's also part of, of how it, it feels, right? We have the wind. We don't see things moving, but there is something about our brains that is funny that makes them feel as if they did. Um, so that idea of, you have a, an image, and at times even a short animation. I've done this too in, in other games where we had a pickup animation, uh, and then depending on which object you would pick up, uh, we would have a different sound. Uh, and that made, made it clear what is it that we were picking up, and it was a way to save on animation. Sounds are 
depending on your sound designer, but sounds are usually faster to make uh, than animations. Another good example of how to use sound to create not only an ambience, but a space where you don't even show uh, one is device six, for those of you who've played it. So here we have a game where the whole uh, narrative of the game is Good made morning. through text, which we're going to talk the about in a minute. The Renaissance man. And we're walking a down a corridor. Problem is the key. A framed number. In the room where red meets yellow in a frame. Plus another framed number between hope and lie. So what you saw here is actually how as you get close to the text that describes the room, the sound in that room, is uh, the volume is rising. So it feels that we're actually walking, that we're actually getting there. And it's all represented through text in a very uh, well done layout so that it reminds, of, uh, uh, reminds us of a space, but it's still uh, kind of feeling that we are walking somewhere. We are evoking a whole space, but we don't have to show it. We just have to write about it. And there's actually some really subtle stuff in device six too that's hard to hear, but you actually hear the individual footsteps as mm -hmm. you scroll the text. Um, and if you stop scrolling the text, the footsteps actually stop. Mm -hmm. And then text is your friend. Uh, as someone, we, both of us are game writers uh, and uh, text is, some people say that text is cheap and I think that that's not really making it justice. Text is about, um, you know, we can have uh, more elaborate um, uh, narratives, um, but also like it's something that is easier to change and to update than any other type of asset. Do you want to talk about eVersion? Yes, so uh, I don't know if you've played this game eVersion, but eVersion is, is not actually a text-based game, uh, but it's a game that uses text, and I think it's important to talk about because uh, you can use text very sparingly in a game to great effect. And uh, eVersion, eVersion is a platformer that slowly descends into a, uh, uh, a kind of cauldron of madness as you play the game. But one of the ways that's expressed is uh, through the text. So when you die in the game, you see, normally you would see ready when you're starting again. Uh, and then late, later in the game, it starts saying things like, look behind you, instead of uh, uh, actually ready. So uh, if you're playing the game late at night, it actually has a huge impact. But that's, but that's also, that's part of the story of the game uh, and uh, the kind of sanity effects that are going on there. Yeah, I mean, basically, the game presents itself as a, like a very happy platformer, um, and the game's really about something that is really sinister that's happening behind the scenes. And the text is the the device that they use to foreshadow it, which is really cool. Superb horror game. Yes. Everybody play it. Yes, it doesn't look like it, but it's one of the best horror games out there. Um, then you know, the, the other two examples that we have here are actually you know text-heavy um, games. Uh, Versu is a system um, where we have like different games that you can download, um, and it's basically kind of like a choose your own adventure system. But it uses a very sophisticated AI to respond to people's input. Uh, whenever you start a, a game, your characters are going to be different, and they're going to react intelligently, more or less, to what you do. Uh, and what I want to to highlight with Versu is that all the kind of actions and nuance that the characters do. Um, comes from the AI and comes from the fact that it's text. If we had to represent with images all the kind of nuanced behavior of these characters, it would have been like a really, really expensive game. It would be something like in like, like um, you know, GTA or something like that. But thanks to text, that's why we can have something that is very sophisticated and yet is still accessible to, to make. Uh, on the other side, we have Black Bar, which is a game um, that is a story. You're basically reading the, the letters that somebody's sending you, a friend of yours, that is in this Ministry of Communication, but after a while you realize it's the Ministry of Censorship, and all the letters that your friend sends are censored, and you have to find out what the words are. Uh, and this is all text. This is not something that is very complicated to, to you know, the, the the, the key of this is that it's really enjoying using text as its mechanics. That is what it's about. It's not about having complicated 3D graphics or, or anything like that. You know, the, 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 the story is conveyed through text, but so, is the, um, so are the mechanics. So uh, in summary here, I mean, I think really the overarching theme here is that 
narrative is usually thought of as, a, as something very resource intensive, and there's lots of clever ways to use resources that can be just as expressive or more expressive than um, uh, than what we normally think of for narrative. I mean, people can. You've, I've heard people say like, you know, narrative is not in the budget, but this is absolute nonsense. Uh, it's always in the budget if you know how to actually use uh, the tools you have. And uh, one of the things that people get too uh, um, stuck on, like I was saying before, is plot, and that really leads people into this idea that narrative is a set sequences, a set sequence of events in time. So we need to create this because if we if this doesn't happen later, then it's not really a story. And really, this is the worst kind of thinking you could get into. So really what you need to do is you need to just give the player the right cues in the core gameplay situation in order to g activate their imagination and just get them to engage dramatically with what they're playing rather than just looking at it as uh, kind of a systemic min-max. Mm -hmm. And also, the, the last thing is really trusting your players. Again, you know, like you give them the pieces. You know, they can imagine the world. It's not that you have to feed it to them. Uh, but we should not l be afraid of, of players filling the gaps of our narrative in the same way that players are going to, in a way, complete our game design. They also complete our narrative. And uh, the, our imagination is probably the best special effects machine ever and also the cheapest. Um, so by giving these pieces, players can also come up with uh, narratives that might be even better than the ones what we could have thought of. And that's that on our, uh, on our part. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Can we take pictures? So the question is like how to use a confined environment for a narrative. I have a, I can start because right. I know. Um, <laughs> theater does this all the time. Theater, we have a stage and it might be a room. And one of the things that you can do is evoking first the outside world. Is there an outside world? Is there not? Um, I studied a lot of Samuel Beckett and things like Endgame, where you don't know what's happened outside, and that's part of the mystery. Um, so, so you can take cues from theater. It's like, okay, what's, what are you pointing out that, that, that is outside? But also in, in things like, uh, games like uh, The Arrester or Gone Home, like the idea of using environmental storytelling, the space where you're in, it might be reduced, but it might, th there is a story of the people who've been there uh, for a long time, and they've left traces. So the gameplay of those games is basically going around and examining the space. The, 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 the value of exploration, of setting up uh, a narrative uh, where we, th th that's the gameplay, reconstructing the narrative, what's happened there, that is also you know, relatively not easy, that's part of what we're doing, but it's one of the challenges and one of the, the kind of gameplay challenges that we should do more of. So, so yeah, like it's not, it's not a particularly, I mean, uh, games have always been a, a kind of um, secluded space. So it's just thinking about things like theater, for example, that have done it for longer. Yeah, and I also want to mention when talking about environmental ex <coughs> environmental storytelling, uh, if you've you know played stuff like Bioshock and uh, uh, in you know Last of Us and all these uh, games, this is a uh, becoming common. I mean, it's become pretty common in mainstream games. I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was more uh, experimental. But it's also really important, I think, to not just kind of choose one of these things and because you're kind of doing one of them, it's kind of like oh, it's great narrative design. Because uh, you can make something that's, you know, environmental storytelling, and that's done really well, but it's still about shooting people, you know. And I suppose that's better than not doing one of them. But uh, you know, I'm, I, I would, I wonder how interesting Bioshock would be, right? If you had that great world building, but then you had more uh, of the kind of uh, verb uh, design that you have in something like, uh, like Dysphoria.
Well, first of all, that it starts multiplying. You know, that's that's the opposite of what we're trying to get at here. That, that thinking in branches is probably the wrong way of going. In, in I, I have an opinion about this. Okay, go. Uh, I think this is actually one of the biggest misconceptions about mm -hmm. what interactive narrative is, thinking that you actually need to script different paths for a player. Uh, this is wrong. Th no, you don't. You don't need to do it. And uh, I mean, you can. It's not wrong necessarily if you do it. But I think that uh, people are kind of like, well, it's not really a video game unless there's like five endings. No, 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 no way. <laughs> you know. And I and I think that um, you can do things with an interactive space and an interactive experience that really activate the player's imagination in terms of how they interpret the experience. If you have a rich system, but g kind of going through the same story, that's like saying, uh, going back to theater, right? You can. I mean, Hamlet is the same every time people perform it in a sense that they go through the same series of events to reach the same ending, but there's something expressive in the performance of the actor. And you can have a core system in a game that allows you to go through the same story in a way that colors the interpretation of the story differently, depending on uh, what kind of leverage the player has to express themselves, so yeah. Yeah, and very quickly, I mean, things like uh, The Walking Dead, they don't even have a lot of branches. They have variables that change, and depending on what you've done before, they might change the scene. The scene is going to remain more or less the same, but there's one thing or two that changes, and that's not branching. That is more thinking in if statements, which is more uh, proper of programming. You have a word for this, right? Expressive choices? Oh, yeah, I just came up with that this week. It's expressive choices. <laughs> Exp ex but expressive choices are the are the choices where uh, somebody said you can't have a choice in a game unless it ch unless it actually changes something in the game system. No, whoever says that, don't ever listen to them again. Um, really, y y you can do something in a game that act that just changes what a character says to you, and everything else is exactly the same in terms of like the overall plot. But that choice, that change, has a huge effect on how it's interpreted, mm -hmm. and w you know. How the player, what the player thinks the story is about. So this is this can be huge. Thank you. Thank you.